Welcome back to the Detect Crime Series webinar presented by Serialize. In each episode, we examine how crime series work. In this, we're getting a little help from our friends, the excellent scholars of the Detect project and our Serialize instructors. In today's episode, we're going to take a look at the most common format of crime shows, the classic police procedural. It's a classic because it's been a staple of TV programming for almost 70 years. But how does it actually work in generating story? Many TV writing manuals speak of the case that walks in through the door. In all practicality, few cases walk because they're usually the stiff at the top of the hour. Either way, a police detective has to investigate how the murder came about. There's clues, there's suspects, in the end the killer is apprehended. Tune in next week to see how our brave heroes save the day yet again. But is that really how these series work? Let's dig a little deeper. What we're interested in here is how the story engine functions. The story engine is the secret sauce that makes TV series such a unique art form. Like the engine of a car, the story engine is made up of several distinct elements. The elements we're going to examine today are series format, character, and theme. These elements have to work in lockstep to keep the engine going. Let's see first how the episodic format works in the police procedural. In the classic police procedural, each episode is self-contained and stands pretty much on its own. There's one specific dramatic dilemma per episode, the case of the week that drives the plot. My dear colleague David Biancooli has pointed out in his excellent history of US TV genres, The Platinum Age, that the classic police procedural has a long, illustrious career, going all the way back to the American series Dragnet from 1951. The show ostensibly dramatized the case files of the Los Angeles Police Department turning just a fact, ma'am, into a catchphrase, and a creative mandate. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. In the show, Police Sergeant Joe Friday and his team followed the clues from the crime to the final perpetrator. The show had little patience for character nuance or development. Joe Friday had no personal life, but simply followed the cases through to their logical end. Moreover, the show lacked an internal memory. That means that the events in one episode never referred back to events in other episodes. Without any emotional baggage, it's no surprise that each case could be wrapped up neatly within the episode's slim 25-minute time frame. Since then, the individual episodes of police procedurals have grown longer. The typical drama is now between 42 and 55 minutes long, depending on the network. Some police procedurals, such as Germany's Tatort or the UK's Midsummer Murders, even use the 90-minute movie of the week format. They have the pacing of a feature film, but the narrative arcs are very similar to the hour-long procedural. Dragnet's Just a Fact, Ma'am, creative mandate outlasted the show. A series like CSI Crime Scene Investigation has shown a similar focus on an objective reality that can be examined and analyzed by dissecting clues, and less interest in the emotional lives of its characters. Many European police procedurals such as Germany's Soko franchise follow a similar pattern and are entirely case-driven with closed-ended storylines in each episode. But there's a second tradition that has evolved in American television, and then moved over to Europe. Police dramas like Hill Street Blues and NYPD Blues in the 1980s and medical dramas like ER in the 1990s included procedural cases in their storylines. But the emotional lives of their protagonists became serialized and continue, continued across multiple episodes. That way the writers could tell longer arcs about the emotional toll that the professional life took on its main characters. This tradition has continued in more contemporary US procedurals. When Lucifer was commissioned by US broadcast network Fox five years ago, it followed a strictly procedural format, but contained a serialized story arc for its main character, Lucifer. The show is about the devil himself, who has grown tired of punishing souls in the underworld and has come to Earth for a little diversion. There, this nonchalant playboy has become the unlikely consultant to the LA Police Department and helps police detective Chloe Decker track down and apprehend killers in the City of Angels. Even though the, case, uh, the show was largely case-driven, the show's episodic structure paid close attention to the emotional life of its main character. 
Interestingly, when the writers broke the storyline for each new episode, they first started by asking themselves this question. What does Lucifer have to learn in this episode? What is he struggling with emotionally? Each episode thus became geared towards a final confrontation between Lucifer and the killer, whom Lucifer and Chloe had been tracking down throughout the episode, and the important lesson that Lucifer was to learn from the killer. Supervising producer Julia Fontana explains this part of the process. And so there would be some sort of a face-off between Lucifer and the killer, and the killer would say something that landed for Lucifer, that taught him something, or the opposite, that made him realize that this killer was completely wrong, that he, that Lucifer, like whatever it is, there was some sort of killer speech that we sort of always had in mind. Okay, what is this crime? You know, how do we get Lucifer to hear what he needs to hear? Like, whatever that was. And that's usually where our cases started. And again, there are different ways of breaking story, but for me, that was the most effective. When we did it that way, when we first figured out the, what is the arc for our main character? Once the writers had figured out the important lesson for Lucifer, then they would start constructing the path that would lead Lucifer to this final scene. And then from there, you would just have to figure out, okay, what is a true crime? That's what we call, the true crime is what we call what actually happened? Because we're not gonna, that's not what we're gonna tell our viewers, right? The first thing that our viewer is gonna see is a dead body in some mysterious circumstances. So you have to figure out, and then you're gonna go on an interesting clue path. And the clue path is how the true crime unfolds. Um, but what happened in the past? So we would figure out what the true crime was, and it, it has to be clean and simple. It can't be, they're, they're, if there's too much backstory, it's going to get boring and confusing, right? Because then you're going to have to unpack those things. How? Like by talking to witnesses and how much do those witnesses know? It's just going to get, so it has to be simple enough, you know, um, but not predictable or boring. <laughs> so something clean for a true, for a true story, uh, for, a, for a true crime. And then um, what are the nice clues that we can find along the way? And what are the twists and turns in which, like, if you think of a crime story as an onion that you're unpeeling, what are the interesting layers to, to unpeel along the way? What are the interesting layers to unpeel along the way? Even though there are certain events we regularly expect from a procedural case, the murder victim is found in the teaser or in Act 1, the investigators examine the crime scene, there are clues that lead to potential suspects, there are a million variations on this basic structure, because how these events are told depends a lot on the specific character that is front and center in the show. Typically, the classic police procedural is structured around the specific personality of the lead investigator. Often, this character has a distinct talent that makes them better at crime solving than anybody around them. It may be an intellectual acuity, a special methodology for analysis, or a certain insensibility for intuiting other people's motivations. American shows have a certain propensity for featuring these men and some women of extraordinary talents, such as elementary Sherlock Holmes, which resets the famous sleuth with the amazing intellect in modern-day New York, the mentalist Patrick Jane, who has highly developed observational skills, lie to me is Cal Lightman, with pretty much the same skill, white collars con artist Neil Caffrey, who outcons the criminals and sometimes the FBI that he works for, Lucifer's charming devil, who makes suspects reveal their deepest desires, or the closer's Brenda Johnson, one of the few women in this league who has an innate skill to tease confessions out of suspects. These characters are usually paired with an every man or every woman partner who is decidedly less talented but also more grounded and acts both as a foil for the main character and as a stand in for the viewer be it Elementary's Dr. Watson or Agent Peter Burke on White Collar, these characters are meant to remind us how normal people would think and act. Sherlock's amazing intellectual abilities allow him to make observations nobody else sees to draw his sharp deductions, yet he cannot solve the case on his own. He needs Dr. Watson's emotional sensitivity to understand the human component in the crime and in himself. European police procedurals have relied less on such high-concept characters. Of course, there are BBC's Sherlock and ITV's Poirot, 
but most contemporary police detectives are more marked for their personality rather than a specific gift or ability. ITV's DCI Barnaby is defined by his calm behavior and stern adherence to moral principles, Sky's Agatha Raisin by her sparkling personality, and ITV's Vera Stanhope by her abrasiveness. Of course, there are exceptions. Belgian Channel 4's Professor T features a main character with exceptional talents and intellect. In the German remake of the format, Professor Thalheim is a brilliant but arrogant and abrasive criminal psychologist. He manages to solve cases by diving deep into a suspect's mind, as well as with a fastidious attention to detail. But his obsessive compulsiveness is based on several neuroses that he has developed over his lifetime. In the course of the series, he must uncover the emotional trauma that he has carried with him over the unsolved death of his father. In this way, the show follows the model set by series like Lucifer in gradually unra unraveling the main character's psychological scars that can, at least partially, explain his eccentric behavior. Professor T has become a popular format adapted for a number of markets. Professor T falls into a character archetype that writer-producer and serialized instructor Nicola Luzuadi has termed the Witcher because it's based on the mythological figure of the magician. This kind of character never touch physically the evil. They tend not to be corrupted by the evil. Tendentially, they stay clean for season and season. And they never have a fight because it's about the power of mind and, and knowledge. Nicola says that the modern variation on this archetype has largely been defined by the character of Gil Grissom, the forensic specialist on crime scene investigation. This character, and those that have followed since in shows like Lie to Me, Numbers, Criminal Minds, relies not only on the power of his intellect, but also on the mastery of a certain science and technology that can produce the knowledge necessary to track down the killers. In this, Nicola notes, the archetype gives a certain level of comfort to the viewer because he or she tells, a, tells us that our mind has all the tools to defeat the evil. There's a second archetype in literary fiction that has been with us at least since the Iliad. If the Witcher is the scientist character who analyzes the crime with his or her mental faculties, the warrior is the cop who gets up close and personal with the crime. In the second family, your archetype is the warrior. Okay? Starsky Hatch. They go down the street. They have leaks. They know people. They touch the evil. They have a lot of fight. They are warrior. They don't beat, they don't find the criminal because of the power of their mind, but because they master the wood, the forest. The town is a labyrinth full of animals, gangs, mobster, thief, psychopath, a lot of people down around, but they know they are able to talk with the fight against, beat someone, keep the information with their strength, with violence, and these are, these are warriors. And the warrior is usually man, a man's man. There are decidedly fewer shows that feature the female warrior. CBS's Cagney and Lacey and the BBC's Happy Valley come to mind. But apart from those, we see few classic police procedurals with female cops physically pushing their way around. Something to think about? But even if the 1970s and 1980s delivered the prototype with shows like Starsky and Hutch, Magnum P.I. or Miami Vice, we find decidedly fewer contemporary series featuring the warrior archetype. It may be exactly for this reason that the creators of Set Once that lets the bullet devised a very deliberate throwback to this 1980s cowboy. In the show, police detective Mick Briscoe wakes up from a coma he suffered after being shot in the head 20 years ago. A lot has changed in the interim. But returning to the police force, Briscoe refuses to adapt and tackles his cases in the same way he did before. Chain smoking, driving fast cars, verbally and sometimes physically abusing witnesses and potential suspects, and flirting shamelessly with women of all stripes, 
playfully slapping their behinds whether they like, they like it or not. DNA analyses, feng shui, and computers are foreign matter to him, and he has little patience for political correctness or civility. He relies on his gumption and the personal contacts he's able to pick up again in his precinct. Yet he finds himself at a loss in rebuilding the family life he once knew and cherished. His wife has moved on, and his daughter, a baby when he last saw her, is a grown woman who barely knows him. The show has become another popular format that has been adapted around the world. The format has become such an international success because the premise asks a very precise question. What does it mean to be a man in modern times? Being able to ask such a pointed question is the last ingredient you need for a well-running story engine. The story engine in the police procedural is more than just solving the case of the week. For crime is not just about following just the facts, ma'am. It's also about understanding human motivation. Most modern pro police procedurals are therefore a debate on ethics, morality, justice, and sexual politics. Each character in the ensemble of the police procedural, the leads, the colleagues at the precincts, and the partners in their personal lives, represent different viewpoints on the particular theme of the show. In Der Letzte Bulle, each male character represents a variation on the theme of masculinity. Briscoe is the charming rogue. His younger partner, Andreas Kringe, is a rules-based control freak with waxed eyebrows and a fondness for tech gadgets. And medical examiner Roland Meisner is a responsible professional and family man who has been dating Briscoe's ex-wife and raising his daughter for the past 15 years. The women on the show represent the feminine response. Police psychologist Tanya Hafner, who is assigned to monitor Briscoe's progress, is attracted to his rogue charms despite herself. The weekly cases animate these character dynamics around the theme of the show. The plots in the first season of Der Letzte Bulle play out a, vari a variation on the theme of masculinity. Fatherhood, marriage, workplace competition, male bonding, sports, pornography. The crime that is the trigger that prompts each character to take up a position and debate the thematic issues. What is important in this debate is that no character is ever completely right or wrong. Even though Briscoe, as the lead, clearly dominates the action, he too has to learn that his views are at times outdated and hurtful. Every week the characters are again confronted with a new uh, challenge to their views and preconceptions, and are forced to argue and defend them with a different outcome each time. It is really this debate that becomes the motor of the show. As fans of a particular series, we will gradually get to know the regular characters and have a sense of how they might respond to the cases and to each other. We can agree or disagree with them, but either way, as viewers, we should always be engaged in this debate. In this way, police procedures provide us with a public forum for debating issues of social import. That remains one of the most important functions of the classic police procedural and may help explain its lasting appeal.